This edition of Computer Club Lesson was recorded on May the 25th, 2015. Enjoy! On this edition of Computer Club Lesson, we're going to investigate why the Internet gets so slow sometimes. We have a question about function keys, thumb drives, USB hard drives, and solid-state drives. All that and more on this edition of Computer Club Lesson. Hello, welcome to Computer Club Lesson. This episode is brought to you by the Binary Guys. All right, ladies and gentlemen, today we are going to investigate why on certain days, some days, the internet is so slow. Um, it can be okay yesterday, and today you can log on in the afternoon and try and do something, and it, pages won't load, they load slowly, um, and there are reasons for it. The first thing we have to investigate when we look at why is the internet slow on, on my machine is you have to ask yourself, is there something wrong with my stuff? Um, has your computer been acting a little funny lately? Is it, uh, have you been getting pop-ups on web pages? Um, and stuff like that. Uh, do you have, you know, toolbars that all of a sudden appeared or did your homepage change from Google to ask? Oh, it's, done that before. <laughs> it's done that before. So that's the investigation of is there something wrong with my stuff? Uh, once you've eliminated that uh, by doing a, a virus scan, a malware scan, uh, just having a look at what programs got downloaded in your programs and features um, and eliminating those. Um, 99, well not 99, but 90 percent of the time that will take care of the problem uh, because your stuff became infected. So you've got to look at your stuff first. But in fact there is something wrong with the Internet. And this goes back to um, how the internet is supposed to work, but there's something wrong with it. This chart shows you how the internet is supposed to work. Your computer connected to the internet. When you call up a web page from your computer that's closed to the outside world, it suddenly opens and it sends a packet to the internet which is always listening and says that packet says I'm requesting information and that's called the synchronization synchronization packet the sync packet and the internet Google page or whatever you've asked for says I'm here and I can talk to you in this way and it gives a list of things that it can do and it sends back that packet as an acknowledgement that I've heard you, the ACK packet, and it tries to synchronize with your, the speed of your internet connection and the speed of the internet, which is always different. It's always different. Um, your internet speed is governed by your internet service provider, but in fact, the, the, the fat pipes on the internet can bombard you with data, but it has to be regulated. And that's where the acknowledgement synch uh, synchronization packet comes from. So the, the two of them make what's called the three-way handshake. I can go this fast. You want this page from this internet service provider out on the internet. So it's negotiating how it can talk to you. And so once that negotiation is done, then your computer will send an acknowledgement packet to the internet saying, okay, 
we can, we've now figured out how we can talk to one another. And the internet you says, okay, I'm ready. And at that point, you, say, you ask the internet for information. You do your Google search. And you type in a couple of words, the internet does its thing, and it sends you back an acknowledgement that it got the packet, and it sends you data. From this point here, from the, from the last listen sync, now you've established the connection, you can move data back and forth. Okay, so in this instance, uh, you type in ABC, the internet acknowledges I got the packet ABC, I acknowledge with DEFG, and your computer acknowledges that it got the packet, and again this received packet, acknowledge the packet, receive packet, until you're all finished. And when you're finished, you send a finish command to the internet. And at that point, it's waiting to close the connection. Okay? And it acknowledges that you've got the finished packet. The ACT packet comes back from the internet to you. And you acknowledge that the you terminated the connection and everything closes. No more talking to the internet. The page, essentially, the page has loaded and it's waiting for its next request. How long should all that take? About 13 milliseconds. <laughs> That's not slow. That's not slow. No. But the this business of the establishment of the data connection, okay, depends on how much data you've asked for. And we'll come to that in a minute. But this is how it's supposed to work. Okay? Packets going back and forth, synchronizing packets, acknowledging packets, and finishing packets to, to close the connection once the page is loaded. Now, all of this is only as fast as the smallest pipe you're connected to. When I say smallest pipe, your internet connection. If you have bought five megabods download speed, that's as fast as it's going to be. By the way, the internet can come at you at hundreds of megabods a second, or megabytes, I should say, a second, because going into the internet service provider is this big fat pipe because it has to service everybody on the internet service providers connection but it only comes at you as fast as the download speed you've purchased if you're on dial-up it's going to take a long time to get that picture if you're on um, internet light, um, it takes a few seconds, but eventually it turns up, depending on the size. And the other thing that we have in here that's important is latency. Now you asked, how long does it take? When I said 13 milliseconds, you have to add in what's called latency. How long does it take the signal to get from your computer to the internet service provider to the internet web page that you're asking for and get an acknowledgement back? That's called latency. And here again, it shouldn't be anything more than 20 milliseconds. Depending on if, if you're asking for a page from Australia, it may be a little longer. But for when we say local, North America, it shouldn't be that much longer. And the latency in, in both instances of the small pipe and the fat pipe are usually the same. Once the latency gets past the, into the internet service provider and out to the internet where it's got fat pipes, the latency still remains the same. But that's what we're talking about here. Your client, the computer you, the computer you own, going to an internet server. Okay. 
Now, for just for a minute, we're, we're going to talk about who's using the internet the most. Depending on the time of day, and usually late afternoon through evening, 30%, and that's a lot, of all internet traffic is Netflix. 30% of it. Another 11% to YouTube. BitTorrents are quite another story. It's 10%, but it's quite another story because instead of opening a single connection, it may open 20. If you're using a BitTorrent client on your computer, a BitTorrent client on your computer, it's, it's technology to allow you to get more open connections. Um, iTunes is only a little bit, Facebook is only a little bit, it's not as much as you would think. Hulu is not that much. And then there's other, okay? There are other kinds of internet traffic like mail, okay? But the biggest users, as we can see from this chart, are video. And at the time of day we're talking about, late afternoon through the evening hours, that's where the majority of traffic, traffic is. Let's face it, you sit down and have your dinner and you want to watch something on Netflix, 6.30, 7 o'clock, click. And televisions, that, you know, your, um, your smart television, which hooks up to Netflix through your internet connection, is in this number as well. It's not just computers. It's all of the smart devices out there that can talk to these video services. All right, so we've seen who's using it, but where are the choke points in the system? Where does it break down to going from fat pipe, lots of data, to skinny pipe, and you have to wait? Okay. Here again, this is how the internet is supposed to work. You've got the public internet cloud, all of the servers there. Um, and there's intermediary servers between um, what we call the last two miles, which is your internet service provider, and you. Okay? There's all kinds of hardware in there, all kinds of different kinds of hardware to make all of this work. That look familiar? Um, very familiar to all of us. You go to look at a video and you get the rotating ball. Well, folks, I'm going to tell you what's wrong with the internet right now. What's causing all of this to happen? And as I said before, once you figure out that it's not your stuff, the problem has to be with the internet itself. And what's wrong with it? Um, over the last two years, um, many um, um, scientists and um, engineers have discovered that the internet is full of excess memory. More memory than it needs. And we call these dark buffers or buffer bloat. As we said before, when we looked at how the internet is supposed to work, um, packets get sent down to you, but if, you're bu if your computer is busy doing something else for a second, those packets go into memory in the routers, the big routers that your ISP has, the big routers that, that um, the last two mile service providers have, it goes into memory so they don't get lost. And that's because the arrival speed from the difference between your home computer and your home internet connection and the ra speed rate of the internet is vastly different. As I said, the internet can come at you at blazingly fast speeds. More packets faster than what your home computer, your home internet service provider can handle. 
So they go into memory. And then the packets go into a lineup, a queue, and they wait for their turn. So as soon as your computer's finished doing what it was doing, it'll reestablish the connection. Okay, give me more packets, give me more packets. The process that I described earlier about how the internet works has to have error correction. It has to have it. In other words, the internet has to make mistakes. There has to be mistakes made so that these synchronization packets and the, these acknowledgement packets can keep on track with what they're supposed to be giving you. When we say synchronization, we are really saying, what speed can you receive me at? What speed can I send you? Packets. And that negotiation is supposed to go on all the time. Um, when you send packets ABC, the internet is supposed to acknowledge that you got ABC and acknowledge that to you. Well, what happens if something goes wrong? You tell the internet, I'm sending ABC, and the internet receives AB. So it sends you an acknowledgement packet, I got AB, you happy? And with that acknowledgement of, well, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, something wrong here. I sent ABC. Resend. So you resend ABC. Then the internet says, oh, okay. You sent me ABC. I can acknowledge that. Everything's good. Let's continue on. DEFG. Down, out it goes to the internet. The internet acknowledges, yes, I got DEFG. And everybody's happy because there's no need to correct the error, continue on. But in that first instance, when there was an error, you have to start over. So you have to start the whole thing again. Acknowledge a synchronization. Acknowledge, uh, send a sync packet. Acknowledge that you got the sync packet. Acknowledge that, that everything is copacetic. That three-way three handshake. It starts all over again. Okay? And so with that, with that, um, the internet says to, says to your computer, now, we've acknowledged, we've, established that I can send you these packets without error, how fast can I send them? And so it starts to slowly build the speed of the packets coming at you. More packets faster. Until it hits that limit where a mistake gets made. And your computer says, well wait a minute, you sent me ABC but I only got AB. Resent. And at that point, the internet throttles back its speed just a little bit to make sure that the packet gets through. In other words, the internet requires that mistakes happen so it can constantly monitor this connection between the internet and you. Okay? It needs the mistakes to happen. In this scenario, we go to what's wrong. And if your computer is dizzily acknowledging that it got packets to the internet and the packets are correct, that takes a little bit of time. So what the internet does is it says, okay, I'm going to keep sending data, but I'll put it in this memory buffer. When you're, when you're open for business again, I'll just send you what's in the memory buffer and I'll refill it in behind you. Okay? So it's like emptying a glass of water and refilling it, empty it, half empty it, fill all the way. Okay? So that is the way that it's supposed to work.
but here's the design flaw. There's always, as I said before, this mismatch between the rate that you can receive, the, the rate that the internet will send stuff, and the rate at which you can receive it. There's a mismatch. And so you can have data flowing to your computer without problem, without error. But the, com the internet is sending you all of these packets and saying, well, your computer's busy painting the screen or processing packets. I'll just keep sending and we'll fill up these memory buffers. And when you're ready, go to the memory buffer and get more. That would be great if in the meantime the internet wasn't asking for acknowledgement packets. Acknowledge to me that the packets I've sent you are correct. But it doesn't get that answer from a memory buffer. It only gets it from your computer that has processed the packet and said, yeah, it's good. Well, without the acknowledgement that that packet was good, then the connection may close and have to start all over again. You're two minutes into a video and the little ball comes up. The reason that happened was that the internet did not get acknowledgement packets saying its information was correct. Start all over again. But your computer is busily trying to process packets from these memory buffers and it may be sending out acknowledgement packets but by that time, by that time the connection closed because the internet did not get an acknowledgement packet that its information was correct. As far as it's concerned, oh, session over. Can Bill Gates fix that? <laughs> Bill Gates had it right in the first place, but let's see why. These devices, these routers, over the years have gotten cheaper and more powerful. They can handle more data at faster speeds. But this old chestnut holds true. No good deed goes unpunished. The makers of these devices, these routers, said to themselves, boy, memory is really cheap. Perhaps we can give ourselves um, a market advantage by putting more memory in these devices and advertising the fact, hey, they're full of memory. Cheap memory. Fast is good. More memory is good. No, it's not. <laughs> not in this instance. So the manufacturers of these things started to put more memory in them because the memory was cheaper. They could put more memory in for the same amount of money and they could advertise that they, hey, these are robust memory machines. So they stuff more memory into the box. It's cheap. They're trying to be helpful. How many times has Microsoft, how many times has Windows tried to be helpful <laughs> and has completely screwed up your machine by trying to be helpful? Don't help. So the result is, as, is the internet as designed stops working as designed because the, of this problem of the packets went into memory before, into some memory somewhere before they got to you. Okay? If there wasn't enough, if, if there was a lot less memory around, then these packets would have to empty out of memory very, very quickly. But because the, that router may hold 16, 20 gigs of memory, it takes a fair amount of time to fill it up. But no acknowledgement packets are going back to the internet saying, well, I got your stuff, and it's correct or incorrect. It didn't come. So that's why this breaks down. 
and you get this. Okay. Um, by the way, in your home router is the same problem. If you've bought a router recently, within the last couple of years, um, the manufacturers just stuffed a lot of memory in it for just this just this reason. The memory was cheap and they could advertise that their routers are full of memory. You'll be happy. Does the laptops have a router? No, no. This is the box that you buy between your internet service provider modem and if you have several computers in your house that hook them up. But in your case probably not. But if you have a router in your home uh, it has this issue as well. Finally, 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 um, computer engineers have discovered that this has happened and they now understand it. When they started to make these routers and things started to go wrong, nobody could understand why. And it's a very vexing problem because a lot of new engineers in the field of computer science don't have a very basic, way, way back, background knowledge of transport control protocol, internet protocol, TCP IP. They don't have that basic understanding. I have a book in my office that's 20 years old. And when I started to discover this stuff, I went back to that book. And that book told me that the packets, if they're held in memory too long, they evaporate into thin air. Because along with everything else that goes on with an internet connection, there is also a thing called time to live. And each packet that comes from the internet has a time to live. That means that if the packet gets routed to the wrong direction, to the wrong computer, to the wrong provider, and it's sitting there spinning around in the routers, after a while the packet just disappears. It dies. It has to or else the internet would be full of lost packets and you couldn't get anything. So the time to live for these packets is relatively short. A hundred milliseconds or so. Relatively short. But think about it, as we first started out, your question was how long does this take? 13 to 25 to maybe 30 milliseconds for this communication back and forth for your, from your computer to take place with the internet. Um, a faulty packet or a packet that's routed to the wrong direction just dies after 100 milliseconds, which is a tenth of a second. Okay, The blink of an eye. It's gone. That's what it's supposed to do. So now that engineers and computer scientists have discovered how this has damaged the transport protocol for TCP IP. They're now redesigning these big powerful routers with a lot less memory so that the buffers don't fill up. Better that the, comp that the packet disappears, becomes dead, than it's sitting in a buffer for 2500 milliseconds waiting to get to the next step, better it should die because the internet will then resend the packet. It gets an acknowledgement. Oh, packet died, resend. But if it's going to a ginormous buffer, it doesn't get that message. So it doesn't resend. So two minutes into your video, the video just quits because the packets are gone. They've disappeared. They're not being reset. Now this is going to take some time because in the last five years the manufacturers of, of uh, this iron have 
built up a great big pool of memory buffers out there. And everybody's going to have to buy new stuff with an appropriate memory buffer to make the internet start working properly again. It's going to take some time. Um, if an internet service provider paid $10,000 for a buffering router and it's not working as, as the internet is designed, well, they're not going to put out another ten grand for another router buffer until it's time to do it, until things get really, really bad. Customer service goes in the tank. So there you go. That's what's wrong with the internet. It's not your stuff. It's a design flaw perpetrated in the last couple of years where there's more memory available on the internet than the internet can handle. Any questions about buffer bloat? No. Buffer, I get a little gray line that runs ahead of the red line. Every once in a while, the grey line stops, the red catches up to it. And your video stops. Buffering, buffering, buffering. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> What's happening there, and you've, you've all seen it, when you start a YouTube video or a video of any kind on the internet, um, the player shows in the red line how much you have used. But that grey line in front of it, is how far ahead the packets have gotten to what you use. And there you go, Brenda, that's why all of a sudden these packets get buffered into this giant memory pool and they're not coming to you. They're not coming to you. And so the gray line stops, the red line catches up, the video says, I've got no more data. Where'd the data go? Sometimes it, it'll continue. Some yeah. Stare at it, and then the gray line starts again. The red catches up with it. Sometimes exactly. I watch a three-minute video because it's something I want to see in twenty-second intervals. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah. And <laughs> and that just shows you that the the gray line showing how much data you have gotten um, is being trapped somewhere and it's no longer coming to you if if that line is jerking it's gives you a couple of seconds a yeah. couple more so seconds couple more, more seconds. seconds yeah and then it slows right down and the red line catches up that's what's happening the data is being thrown into internet buffers and it's not getting to you no. Oh. <laughs> it always gets to you though eventually. Right? Eventually, yeah. Um, if you start over, uh, if you were to close that video and start over again, it may just run completely through fine. Remember, <laughs> yeah, remember that uh, I told you last week that, and somebody mentioned it, it's like be being on a party line telephone. Yeah. Okay. Um, that everybody is using it at the same time and so you have to wait your turn for your packets. And this seems to happen on some things and not others like I watch I get downloads from Bubba Mail. Never happens. Perfect videos. And yet Huffington Post, the actual news I want to see, or the BBC or Australia's news, always happens. Okay, uh, let's talk about the BBC in Australia because they are far away. Yeah. In a perfect world of the internet, what's supposed to happen is that the internet in North America is supposed to have giant machines that go to the BBC in the UK, um, scrape all their stuff, and bring it back here to give you the illusion of a faster connection because it's being hosted in memory here. But sometimes that's not happening. Um, your connection is directly to the BBC through an undersea cable, okay? And if you, if you were able to do a ping 
of that server, you would find that the ping time is 50 milliseconds, 80 milliseconds, something like that, where the ping time should be 13 to 20. So the longer ping time means that there's a longer time for the data to go out and come back. And you're using it faster than it can make the return trip. So that's why you got to wait for it to yeah. buffer, right? Yeah. Yeah. I've had that too. Yeah. Um, sometimes, it, you, here's a trick you can try. Uh, I don't know whether it will work in every case, but I've tried this where you get a video and it starts to buffer out on you, just pause the video. And while it's paused, it can still receive packets. Okay, You might see that gray line start to advance while the video is paused. Try that. Try that for, put on pause for a couple of minutes and see if that gray line advances. If it does, you can wait for it to advance all the way as a complete download and then you can play the video. Sometimes that works. Um, any other questions about buffer bloat? I love that name. <laughs> but it, it's, it's true to its name. It's, it's just that there's too much memory out there. And the internet doesn't work that way. It needs the error correction to happen on a regular basis. And when I say, say regular basis, I mean as a full packet is completed, it needs that acknowledgement that the packet is completed correctly and I'm not going to send any more until I know that you got the correct packet in the first place. Okay? And if it's not correct, tell me all about it and I'll resend it. That's how that's it's supposed to work. It's really a fantastic system. Uh, and as it was designed 30 years ago, um, there's nothing wrong with it. Now, one other thing that I will tell you about, uh, I don't really have a good way to illustrate it, um, other than, let me see here. in this diagram. This is TCP, Transmission Control Protocol. In most cases when you get video on your computer it's UDP. TCP requires error correction to a large degree. Every packet that comes at you it, that packet must be acknowledged that you got it and that the data is correct. That's error correction. Universal Datagram Packets, UDP, are most videos on the internet. And that system is called best effort. And for the, for the best effort to work, once the data starts to flow, um, UDP does not require as many acknowledgments of correct data. And so you get a data packet which shows you a couple of seconds of video and there, it might be a little blocky, okay, or the color might be just a tad off. Um, that's the internet sending you this stuff with its best effort. You don't have to tell me every time I've got a datagram wrong. But every once in a while tell me whether I'm getting the data at the proper speed. That's all. Okay. So you get little blockies in maybe um, uh, the, the video becomes choppy. Okay. That's just the best effort. It's not fully error corrected. But that's another, it still has to do with, okay, I've got all this data. Was it correct? Acknowledge that, acknowledge at least that you got data for the universal datagram. Acknowledge, at least acknowledge that you got it. 
But the buffers in the internet, the dark buffers, take, slurp up all that data and they don't acknowledge anything. They just hang on to it long enough for the connection to close. Okay, here again, that time to live. If it's too short, which in most cases on fast internet connections it is, it's a short amount of time, um, the data just goes poof and dies. All right. Buffering have anything to do with uh, sometimes when I'm watching a video, it turns into pixels. And that's what I'm saying. Is yeah, yeah. It, it got blocky, and and that's the the um, the internet saying I don't care about blockiness. I don't care about color reproduction. I don't care about anything. You just did you get the data? Okay, it's its best effort, and if there's something wrong with it. A little bit here and there. Um, let's not go through the overhead of every packet having to be acknowledged. We're talking about a lot of data here and it takes a long time. That's as far as the internet's concerned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eventually it has, your computer has to send back an acknowledgement, yes data is still coming. Uh, it may be coming a little bit too fast, the, the errors are getting a little bit too large. S throttle back the speed a little bit to allow me to catch up. Okay, But if everything is just going into a memory buffer, it's going in at the fastest speed it can go. And if you wait too long, those data packets disappear. Um, Okay, anything else? Uh, now I gotta go through the whole thing again. There. Um, okay, do we have any other kinds of questions for today? Will Windows 10 help any of this? No, no. Um, it's, it's, not a it's a question of the hardware out there, not the software. Uh, they have tried software fixes for this and it just doesn't work. It's the way the internet works. It has to work exactly this way or nothing works. And so there's no way to fiddle the internet protocol to make all this work. There's no way to fiddle it and software can't help. It had the, the hardware has to be redone. Sure, that's the question I'm asking. Oh, okay. These blue numbers on the keys, what are they? How can I use them? Should I use them? Blue numbers on the keys. Okay. I've got green numbers on my keyboard. Oh, okay. Well, mine are blue. <laughs> it's the third. It doesn't have anything to do with capitals or outline. No. It has everything to do with function. The FN key. Oh, okay. All right. Um... You can tap the FN key, the function key, and it, does your computer have a number pad beside it, or are there the numbers built into the keyboard? Um, okay, this does not have a number pad off to the side. Oh, the I have numbers, a number pad here, okay. but I never use it, I always use these. Yeah, um, in this case, you'll see on this computer that the uh, it has oh a function key and all of the number pad keys are built into the keyboard. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So I can use this function this function key to activate four, five, six, um, one, two, three, Don't and the zero. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, these um, these extra key or these extra things on each key yeah. are a function of the function key. When you turn the function key on, they should work. What they should they do? do they should do what they say. Um, in this case, yeah, in this case, in this case, if I tap the function key and I press this key right here, I should get plus. Okay? If I use if I use the shift key on the same key, I'll get a question mark. It just 
it remaps how the keyboard works. Okay, yeah. If if you don't need it, leave it alone. Yeah. Um, yeah. I I had one client who uh, tapped that function key, and uh, it cost him a ninety dollar house call for me to go to his home and discover that he tapped the function key, and I tapped it again, and his keyboard was back to normal. Uh, some of those function keys get you out of trouble. Yeah, they can get you out of trouble. Yeah, but you get in more trouble with them now. <laughs> yeah. You got to know them. You got to know this. Yeah, you, you know, the, this is where the instructions for your computer will come in handy. To they don't come with instruction books though. Well, then uh, Google is great for that. Menus there, but they have they have their little guides. So you have to go in yeah. and get the guide. Yeah. You know. Yeah. 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 Um, okay, so that's that's keyboards. Now, um, keyboards and, uh, on laptops and uh, electronic keyboards on tablets um, can be changed. We can do what's called keyboard mapping. And so let us just say that you were Russian and you wanted to talk to your friends with a Cyrillic alphabet. You could change the keyboard mapping to become Cyrillic. Right? It's, it's a feature. It's a feature of most modern computers. Rather than buy another keyboard that is only Cyrillic, you can remap the keyboard on your present computer to become Cyrillic. Or any other Chinese, Japanese, Korean, anything. It can be remapped to use that language alphabet. Uh, anything else? Um, it's summertime. Um, any questions about uh, your cameras and such being used with your computers to get your get your pictures off? Any problems with that lately? Um, I just wanted to make sure that everybody is going to be able to get their pictures off their their cameras before they get destroyed. Well, that's a good damn, so I put them all on, on thumb drives because I, I never knew that you could take a thumb drive to Walmart and plug that in. I always yeah. thought you had to take the thing out of the camera, the little... Yeah, part. yeah. Now the, you can take, put, like I've got a bunch of pictures I yeah. want to put. That can just be plugged in at Walmart and have pictures made. Yeah, but I recommend the thumb drives for temporary moving. Yeah. Yeah, for just temporary storage, moving from one location to another. I don't recommend them as a storage solution to be permanent storage of your stuff. Um, thumb drives are delicate. You can plug them into an unknown computer and they can be destroyed. Oh, okay. It's, um, it, it can happen. The pictures just go away. Uh, or the, the thumb drive burns out because it got a voltage, uh, voltage jolt, and then you're really in trouble because whatever's on there is unrecoverable. So you can always learn to just copy disc? them anyway. So you're better off keeping the disk? Um, yeah, if you want to burn your pictures to disk, that's fine. Do that. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that you can do um, is you can go to Best Buy and you can purchase a USB hard drive. It's about that big. We're not big at all. Um, now, the only problem with USB spinning hard drives is that if you give it a good bump, you drop it while it's spinning. You can destroy it. So, the latest iteration of USB hard drives is memory hard drives. Um, non-volatile memory hard drives. In other words, it's they're like a USB stick, only instead of 64 gigs, they're 250 gigs. They are the size of a computer's hard drive, and they are very fast. Um, but as a permanent storage solution, I still recommend 
um, USB hard drives and failing that, a permanent solution is to put your stuff on disk. I have one, Bob, it's called a Passport? Yes. And it's got one terabyte. Yeah, yeah. The, the, you can buy one up to six terabytes now. Yeah, this one I think was something like about 100 bucks. Like yeah, that. yeah. The, the thing of it is though, with hard drives, um, that hard drive, the drive inside of it, the spinning drive, has not changed in size, in form factor, for 10 years or more. Uh, a, two, a two and a half inch drive um, fits inside of a package about like that. The form factor has become unchanged. But the earliest ones were 512 megabytes. Okay? Now you can get a one gigabyte drive and the form factor is still the same. So what that means is you're packing a lot more data into the same space as the original design of a two and a half inch drive. Anything goes wrong with how that data is packed in there. The hard drive itself, uh, its electronics can get messed up and the, uh, the file format of the drive can become damaged and then you've lost all your stuff. Um, they are delicate and so you have to be very careful about moving them around and making sure that they, they are protected. I had one client who had um, a hard drive um, about twice the size of this telephone and it was on his desk and he hit it with his hand and it flopped over sideways while it was running. That made the head of the hard drive, the writing head, crash into the platters and destroyed it. I, his data was unrecoverable from that point on. I mean, I tried. I tried for a month but to get something off. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. The, the, the latest um, hard drives that are nothing but uh, just memory chips don't have moving parts, okay? There isn't, there's, in the computers of the last couple of years, uh, if you want to pay the freight, there are no, move, no more moving parts in them. The only moving part in this computer is the hard drive. It's a spinning disk, okay? Um, and the newest version of this laptop does not have that spinning disk. It's all non-volatile memory. It's a little expensive for now, but the price of that stuff is coming down too. Um, two years ago, uh, a memory drive that was um, 64 gigabytes, just enough room for the operating system and a little bit more storage space, was upwards of $1,000. Now you can, there are one terabyte drives coming on the market that are now about $450. So you get more memory for a lot less money. But they are still expensive at $450. When you can talk, when you can go to the store and buy a spinning hard drive for $79. All right? It's not a convenience thing. It's, it's the wave of the future that the last moving parts of a computer are now safe from damage other than electrical failure. That's a good thing. Okay, we've just about beaten it up, folks. I'll get this video online as soon as I can. <laughs> you like the whole video idea, do you? I do. I do. All right. Yeah. Um, I'm going to... Uh, over the next little while, I'm going to be sending out um, some email messages to other club members to ask them what they would like to see in the way of talks and instruction. Um, if you have anything amongst yourselves that you want to see come up over the summertime, 
please send me something and I'll see what can be done. Maybe get a 10 minute video out of your questions answered. All right. Thank you so much. That's Computer Club lesson for today. Thank you so much for watching. Bye-bye.